Okay, good morning, everyone. I'll just get myself set up here so I can see what I'm doing. All right, well, today we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 2. So you might like to um, use your device or turn to 2 Peter in your Bible. Um, I like reading the Bible. Hope you do too. And uh, I often read a portion before I go to sleep at night and I pick something encouraging and, um, and familiar to do that. <clears throat> and the chapter, the chapter we're looking at today is really not bedtime reading. In fact, it's, uh, it's quite an unsettling chapter uh, in its content. So what's it all about? Let's, um, let's have a look at the PowerPoint. Uh, if we can put that up there. There we go. All right, well, you can sort of see what's there. Um, I'm glad I don't have to do that with my eyes. Oh, side lashes, aren't you glad, guys? Um, what a pain. And if you're looking for a car and you talk to the wrong salesman and you, uh, you take him for his word, you end up with one of those things down the bottom there, which is not what you want at all. Uh, China, they have these glass walkways. You might have seen one of these on YouTube and some clever Chinese engineer has figured out a way to make the glass looks like, look like it's cracking when you're walking along the glass. Uh, which is a bit disconcerting, especially when the walkway is about 180 metres up the side of a cliff and you're walking along and all of a sudden you put your foot down and it starts cracking. If you want to see something really funny, have a look at that on YouTube. But it's, um, it's false. It's not real what's happening. Passports. You go through customs, you always sort of wonder, yeah, am I going to get through here? I take a good look at your passport. Is that really you? And then sometimes, in some cases, of course, People go through with um, false passports, especially if your name's Jason Bourne. And today, one of the big um, themes in society seems to be this, this issue of false accusations. It's so easy to make a false accusation about uh, things, especially in the family courts. And judges um, have a job working out what's going on. And you don't want to get caught with one of those either. Uh, the, the poor guy that got... Um, <coughs> Got his, got his neck knelt on in America was uh, arrested because they thought he was dealing with uh, counterfeit money. That was the original reason for the arrest. And last of all, wolf in sheep's clothing. It's false. And he's there to do no good. So chapter two uh, is the main reason why Peter writes this second letter. And its number one purpose is to warn us, to warn Christians in the church about false teachers and false prophets. And uh, they infiltrate con congregations and with determination, they mislead Christians. And um, I've witnessed this sort of thing a couple of times in churches that we've attended over the years. And there's often a process involved and to begin with, these teachers appear genuine and they show concern for others in the congregation and they're interesting characters. They're good communicators and they work hard to gain acceptance. But what they do is this, they target a select group within the church, uh, maybe a home group, uh, maybe the personnel working in a particular ministry uh, and they start spreading their ideas. And eventually these teachings come out into the open and the whole church becomes aware that there's something going on. And maybe by that time it's too late. And that's how it works. And it's too late because by that stage, people have already been conned into making commitments into practices which are wrong. And it's hard to wind the clock back. We better read the first two verses uh, in chapter two, and we'll go, we'll go back to the last verse of chapter one, uh, which I guess you heard last week. I'm not sure whether it was last week or the week before. 
It says, for prophecy, that's real prophecy, true prophecy, never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, that's real prophets, true prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. So there are two disturbing things here. First, it says that many will follow and get involved in practices and, um, and things that eventually break up their fellowship with other Christians and diminish their Christian witness. And that's really sad. And the second disturbing thing here is that some people get hurt. Whenever this sort of thing happens, people get hurt. And that gives the wrong impression of what Christians are supposed to be all about, which is degrading to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, who are these false teachers? Who are they? And um, it's often hard to tell. Even a person who appears to have a godly lifestyle and a relationship with the Lord Jesus can bring in destructive heresies, ideas and practices which are contrary to God's way. So Paul warns us to be on guard and to be aware that there is a potential threat and we have to watch out. And here's a little overview of what Peter is doing. <clears throat> so in 1 Peter, his main point is to warn Christians about external opposition. Be ready for hostility and persecution. That's coming. You can expect it. In 2 Peter, he is warning us about internal opposition, false teaching and heresy. So there's danger from outside the church and there's danger from within. And in 1 Peter, there's a call for endurance. And in 2 Peter, there's a call for action. And uh, his point there is don't tolerate false teaching. Do something about it. Have your alerts going and be ready to counter anything that crops up that looks as though it's going to put people on the wrong path. Let's just take a moment to pray before we go on. Heavenly Father, we know that everything you tell us in the scriptures is given to us for our good. We know that you care about us deeply and personally, and we need a reminder of the consequences of certain actions of wrong choices. We acknowledge that we don't know everything. We're vulnerable and can be misled if we're not careful. Help us to take to heart your holy scriptures and apply them in our own situation. Open our hearts to receive what you have for us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so how do you spot a false teacher? As I've already mentioned, uh, looks and lifestyle can be deceiving, and they don't wear a badge that says, hello, I'm a false teacher. Uh, but we need to know. And as we read through the chapter, which we're not going to do, Peter gives us some clues, um, and he describes the character of the people that are, were involved in what was going on back there in the first century. So here's a resume for a false teacher. Um, at heart, they are false. And you go through all these things through the chapter. These are the things that Paul mentions, and I've put a couple of extra things in there as well. At heart, they are false. They may be sincere, but they are false. They sow their ideas by stealth. There's an element of secrecy. It's not out in the open to begin with. They're motivated by their own desires and greed. That was the situation in the first century. They fabricate stories and they make up lies. They follow and advocate corrupt desires of the flesh. What's that? It's I want, I need, I have to have, and so on. They play on those natural desires that we have uh, and we have to fight against all the time in our Christian life. They despise authority in the church and ultimately the authority of 
the Lord Jesus himself. So they undermine order in the church. They elevate themselves. They want the spotlight and they want to lead. They promote ideas about our freedom, but are themselves slaves to depravity. That was the situation that uh, was happening in the church. That's the kind of person that was involved. As time goes by, they become bold and arrogant. I had a friend that I played soccer with. Um, he was a good guy, but he, um, he thought he was a prophet. And he came from a you know, particular denomination that kind of accentuated those things. And uh, I can remember him standing out the front of the building, having an argument with one of the leaders of the church. And he was saying, I'm a prophet. You can't argue with me. Bold and arrogant. But what they say goes against the character of God. And it amounts, in effect, to blasphemy. That's what um, Peter says here in verse 12. And one of the effects um, when people are caught up in this kind of teaching is that they get involved in behavior and practices which are unseemly and ungodly. And if you're ever involved in anything like that, you need to do a serious rethink and pray and submit yourself to God and search the scriptures and maybe talk to other Christians that you know are on the right track. Peter tells us that people are deceived so that they follow their natural instincts, their passion and reason. And he describes the false teachers as slaves to pleasure, with eyes full of adultery. And there's more than a hint of sexual immorality being involved in what was going on at that time. Let's just read verses 18 and 19 um, in chapter 2. It says, for they mouth empty boastful words and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. So what all this means is that uh, these false teachers in the past, and many false teachers today, present um, a kind of practice that has self-gratification at its core. It's pampering to self. And there are other warnings in the scripture about this sort of thing. For instance, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And that's the way it is in many uh, progressive churches today. And any church is prone to this sort of thing if you're not on guard. Now, you might be wondering what exactly was it that disturbed Peter and got him to write this letter in the first place, what was going on? <clears throat> well, it's most likely that he was responding to um, growing instances in that early church of um, people who were starting to question the teaching of the apostles and um, introducing other ideas that were wrong. They were distorting the early um, teachings of um, people like Paul especially. And uh, one particular thing being attacked may have been what Paul said about our liberty and freedom in Christ. And if you just have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Worth turning to. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that's good. But they were putting the idea out there that since the penalty for our sins has been paid in full, Christians now have a greater kind of moral freedom, a license to do what you want because we're now free from the law. There's no restrictions. It's all been paid for in full. And that was the kind of trend um, in the thinking. And they promoted the idea that we needn't be so concerned about our moral decisions anymore. 
which was leading people into re-entering the scene of sexually corrupt practices, and they were becoming slaves again to self. The thing is that at heart, people who promote these kind of things are rebels. Just excuse me for a moment. Heard a debate on the radio driving home from work about whether or not it's the right thing to do to use a hanky now that we've got COVID-19. And all sorts of people ringing up. Yes, no, maybe. But it is convenient when you're standing up here. Sin involves our making a choice against the right of God to rule. The right of God to rule in our lives, the right of God to rule in the church, and there's a denial of the scriptures involved in this sort of thing. So people at heart, sin, in essence, is rebellion. Rebellion against what God wants us to do. We want to go our own way. And Peter warns that those who deliberately mislead are in for severe judgment. And he echoes that a couple of times in this chapter. And he uses three illustrations. Here we go. See if you can pick what, uh, what goes with what here. Firstly, he talks about the rebellion that occurred a long time ago, and we don't know the details, of fallen angels. There was a sort of a ruckus in heaven in a way between angels who wanted to go along with the rule of God and some who wanted to go their own way. And it says that they have been put in chains in darkness in hell. And they're still there. But we're not given the details. And the second example he reminds the readers about is the rebellion against the knowledge of God that led civilization on a downward spiral of violence, culminating in the judgment and destruction of the whole world in Noah's flood. It was a real-time event, and Peter affirms the Old Testament account. It was all about the rebellion of the people in the world that was then. They wanted to go their own way, and they ignored the knowledge of God. And the third example that he talks about in the chapter is the cataclysmic destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their practices of sexual perversion. And in each case, what was going on is that people, or angels in one case, they wanted the freedom to go their own way and do their own thing. Now, it all sounds pretty dismal, and I told you, but it's not bedtime reading. Um, but Peter's trying to stem the tide of heresy and false teaching that was growing in that early church. <clears throat> and to counter the false teaching, he emphasizes the importance of clinging to the proper knowledge of God. And in um, chapter 1 of Second Peter, there are points there that he makes uh, about that, that we need to uh, take hold of the precious promises of God in the Scripture, that we need to be working to uh, work out the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, especially self-control. So the knowledge of God is important. The word knowledge appears in one form or another 15 times, apparently, in this three-chapter letter. You might not see it in your particular um, version, but in the original language, it's there 15 times. He emphasizes the knowledge of God that we get from the Scripture. So he points to the Word of God as the essential means of learning and growing as a Christian. So get into the Word yourself. If you're really familiar with what the Lord is saying in the New Testament especially, you won't be fooled so easily. Read the word of God. Work it out for yourself. Pursue the truth. It's there in God's word. Now, in verses 15 and 16, uh, Peter refers to Balaam as an example. And I can remember, I think Kevin White spoke about Balaam not so long ago. Uh, and we read about him in the Old Testament in Numbers chapters 21 through to 24. And he's an interesting character. It's hard to actually work out what's going on with Balaam. But the, the basic story is that when the Israelites approached the land of Moab, the king of Moab panicked. He didn't need to because God had told Moses not to go into Moab. Uh, they were descendants of Lot. 
So they were going to go around Moab, but the king didn't, um, he, did, he either didn't take any notice or he didn't realize or he just didn't bother to inquire. And so he panicked and he sent for Balaam. And he offered Balaam a reward to prophesy against Israel or to curse them. And apparently Balaam had a reputation for doing that sort of thing and I guess getting it right. And uh, as we look at Balaam, we, we see that he did know about the one true God. He had a relationship with God. God actually spoke to him. And Balaam should have recognized that he was going against God when he agreed to go and meet the king. But to cut a long short, uh, story short, um, Balaam rebelled against that knowledge that he had of God and eventually... Uh, reading between the lines, we can see that Balaam got together secretly with the king and suggested a strategy to defeat Israel. And the plan involved enticing them into sexual misconduct, which happened. And uh, it was one of the sad events in Israel's story as they went around through that part on the way to Canaan. But it cost Balaam his life. He was obstinate in his desire to get wealthy. And um, Balaam hung around the king of Moab. The king would ask him to, do, to, to prophesy against Israel and God would tell him or give him a prophecy that was actually a blessing. And that's a picture on the bottom right hand corner of Balaam blessing the people of Israel and the king there, Balaam, he's not too pleased. But the thing is Balaam sort of hung around and uh, his perverse heart and his greed took control. He wasn't really God's man. He was his own man. And um, he made the mistake of not getting out of there. And that's the case with false teachers. We should ask ourselves, is what I am doing motivated by the desire to honor the Lord because he is worthy? Remember the Lord's prayer. Do we want to see his kingdom come? To have his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Those are the right motives that we should have in our service for the Lord. Okay, and what about Lot? There are all sorts of characters in this chapter from the Old Testament. And uh, he also talks about Lot. Uh, there's Lot in the bottom left-hand picture. Lot and Abraham, they're looking out over the land, deciding what to do. Lot was Abraham's nephew, and they had traveled together to the land of Canaan. And um, the story goes like this. They were traveling through Canaan together, and God blesses them. So they have, uh, they've got sheep and cattle and donkeys and whatever. And there's just so much uh, activity that there's not enough room for the animals in the pasture and so on and everybody's tripping over everybody else so abraham gets together with lot and he says look this isn't working you go down to the plains and i'll stay here in the hills or else vice versa your choice and lot chooses the the, uh, the lush rich grassy plains it's a pretty good lifestyle down there wealth for toil and so he packs up with his whole group and all his animals and so on and they move on down to the plains closer to Sodom and Gomorrah but uh, Lot ends up in Sodom and that's a bad place to be it's a really bad place to be and the Bible says in verse 8 that Lot was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard Lot was tormented. It didn't sit well with him. But it intrigued Balaam. Or so it seems. The difference between Lot and Balaam. Lot wasn't actually doing anything wrong. And God graciously rescued him. But Lot wasn't going anywhere either. He was shackled to being stuck in Sodom and... What was happening in Sodom sort of rubbed off on his personality a little bit. It's inevitable. But God rescued him anyway. And we can see that even when people get caught up 
in the wrong scene, maybe false teaching, false teaching that's going on in the church, they can still turn to the Lord and he will rescue them. If they've done wrong, they need to repent. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Times of refreshing from the Lord. So in closing, um, I want to just think about some of the false teaching sort of scenarios that are out there today that we might encounter. And I sort of think of these as being wrappings. False teaching comes in different wrappings that um, we can recognize. Um, you open up the wrapping and really there's what you thought was in there is not there at all. It's false. And the first one I've called the something else wrapping. Yes, you have Jesus and you've been converted, but you need something else. Maybe a greater personal experience of the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's a requirement to do something extra in order to be happy and to achieve what you want to achieve as a Christian. But no, knowing Jesus and following Jesus is sufficient. And there's a book called um, The Sufficiency of Christ. I'm trying to remember who wrote it, but he points out the fact that we have everything in Christ. We just got to work it out and take hold of it. And the second one there is the prosperity gospel wrapping. And they teach that God intends to bless you with health and wealth. And he doesn't intend that you should suffer loss in any way. And if you do, something's wrong. Give me your money and I'll work it out for you. But it's an empty box because the Bible clearly teaches that we can expect trouble and persecution and suffering in this life. That's what First Peter is all about. But God's able to sustain us and he works all things out for good eventually if we trust in him and we follow him wholeheartedly. And then the third one is what I've called warm fuzzies, a wrapping of warm fuzzings. And in some churches, the approach is that God is love, which he is. But um, they sort of put the spin on it that he can't possibly send anyone to hell. Don't worry about sin. Just love other people. Do good. That sort of thing. And I've been reading through gospel, the Gospel of Matthew recently, and it's amazing how many times, this is the first book in the New Testament, it's amazing how many times Jesus challenged his listeners with warnings about the consequences for rejecting his message. And he warns about the judgment and hell. So hell is a real place. And the last one is the wrapping of academic conformity, which I'm always interested in from a science sort of background. And um, it goes like this. Some modern Teachers talk about Christianity with a mix of humanism, materialism, and evolutionism. The Bible doesn't tell the whole story, they love to say. You get that from science. You have to blend what the Bible says with what scientists claim to be true, what scientists claim to be the truth. And that's actually atheistic scientists. They're the ones who are calling the tune. If you follow their line of thought, you end up with a diminished view of human significance, that we are not made in the image of God. Rather, we're just another animal species. And we end up thinking that we can do what we like. The strongest wins. And who's going to hold us to account? And that's very prevalent. And the thing is that a little bit about each one of these kind of um, different False teachings, we, we kind of have a little bit of it in our worldview, if you think about it. A little bit of everything permeates, and you've got to guard against that and stick to the word of God. As I prepared this message, I remembered an old chorus, and maybe you know it. Make me true, Lord Jesus, make me true. Make me true, Lord Jesus, make me true. There's a race that I must run there are victories to be won give me power every hour to be true let's just pray 
Heavenly Father, we, uh, we love you because you have first loved us and you've blessed us with your mercy and your grace. Thank you for giving us the scriptures to guide us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the example and words and the meaning of everything that the Lord Jesus did for us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.